Before we jump into today's matches, I just want to send a very heartfelt thank you to everybody who's been watching and supporting my videos. I could not believe that on the popular tab of Dreamborn Inc, our Beast and Shadow 2.0 is currently the number one deck on the website and our Floodborne discard is currently in fourth place with almost 4,000 views and 103 favorites. I think it's safe to say that you guys are a fan of this deck, so I'm posting another video where you can see some more matchups with it. Um, but I just want to mention that you can always come over to Dreamborn Inc and see the deck list, see if you know, it was updated, um, see some additional stats like the cost curve, uh, the color ratio, the card type ratio, etc. And you can also click on my profile to see all of the decks that I have created, you know, again, and you can see like, this is the first iteration of Beast and Shadow. It's 25 days old and this new one is four days old. So, you know, 20 days in between them and how do the decks differ, right? Maybe you've looked at this one and you were trying to build it all quantum now that the metagame is kind of changed or settled or whatever. What updates do I need to make to the deck that I play, played before in order to make it more competitive? Um, in addition to that, you can see additional decks that I'm working on. So, you know, these ones are privated right now, but you know, I'm going to be making a budget series or something maybe in the future uh, but maybe you're interested in seeing certain matchups with a, a particular particular color combination or against a particular strategy and you know maybe i'm making uh ruby amber next and you're like oh quantum if you, when you make that video i'd really appreciate it if you could include a match against a ruby sapphire deck and i'd be happy to do that for you so you know those comments in the comment section really do play a big part um, in how i want to create ne my next uh, set of content so again i do appreciate the interaction with you guys but anyways let's Let's go ahead now and jump into those matches. So just as a reminder of some of the explosive potential of what this deck can do when you get set up with either or both of the Cheshire Cat and Beast Relentless, you're going to see me be able to take out this entire opponent's board and what I talked about in my decklist video is the Beast Relentless kind of acting like a pseudo scar as you can see here every time I take out an opponent's card I get to ready up my beast because I've dealt damage to it and if I just get damage on anything even if Beast doesn't take it out, I can use the Cheshire Cat to banish it. So you can see here, we've absolutely decimated the opponent's board. We have five characters on field and I could have sung the whole new world with that Beast Relentless, but I just decided why not just cast it and pass turn and look at the board state now. We are plus five on that wheel. The opponent can't really do anything. And then once again, just showing the dominance of the deck, especially with two Relentless on field. We just out the entire opponent's board once again and we're questing for, I don't even know how much this is or potentially could be, but it's a lot. And again, it's just showing you how insane the deck can be. Um, so yeah, just a quick little reminder of some of the explosive potential of this deck. And of course, as you get up to this point, you have the steel cards for removal to deal with aggro and things like that. But let's get into a full match here. All right, so in this video here, we're gonna put back our uninkable Grab Your Swords and the Cheshire Cat. To start off, we ink a Benja and pass because we have no one drop and inking Benja always feels kind of bittersweet in the beginning because you never know if you're going to need it later on. You just have to hope you draw into one. But again, because we have Beast Tragic Hero, which we just inked there and a whole new world, pretty confident that we can draw the other two at some point in the match if we need it. The opponent reveals that they are also on Emerald Steel though. And speaking of which, there's a Benja. Knowing Emerald Steel, I don't need them. So that's why I'm inking it there again. And we're going to opt to drop our Cheshire Cat and then pass. Now you may have wondered why did I drop Hook instead of the Robin Hood and that's just to prevent them from establishing a bit of a wider board with their own Captain Hook um, uh, potentially questing and stuff as well. My Captain Hook kind of puts a stop to any aggro and the opponent reveals that they're on discard inking a Hypnotize and playing a Prince John. We're going to go ahead and ink the Ring the Bell and drop the Tinkerbell because playing discard I know the one of the weaknesses of it is that it struggles with aggro. Um, and while they may be able to rip apart my hand, that's totally fine because if I have big threats on board, you are likely not going to be able to deal with them. Now, I do have to be wary of the steel removal cards like Smash on the Tinkerbell and things like that, but my opponent opts to trade their hook into my Cheshire Cat, which again is a trade up, a one cost character for a three. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ink my Smash and play my Beast Tragic Hero, which directly counters discard, by the way, if you didn't know, FYI. Um, because yes, they're going to be able to discard my hand here and draw with their Prince John. Yeah, they, they go with the Lucifer. And now I have no cards in hand, but look at the board state. Okay, you've used your ink for the turn. I'm going to draw two and ooh, this is a tough choice. Do I play the Tinkerbell here or do I play the Beast Tragic Hero? And I'm like, I'm going to go for a Tragic Hero because I want to increase the chances that I can draw into a whole new world because this just completely shuts discard down. Now it looks pretty dire, right? The opponent has seven cards in hand i have none but the board presence matters here these small characters aren't really doing all that much my opponent does end up setting up 
um, an, an insane potential shift play, which would be a huge problem. Thankfully, the Beast Tragic Hero Call was super clutch because we draw into grab your swords and a whole new world and an inkable. So we literally play out our whole hand and reset the entire void state. My opponent did indeed have Cinderella and Tinkerbell ready to drop next turn. So did I get a little lucky there? Probably, but making the right calls to go for the draw power with the Beast Tragic Hero, knowing what I needed to draw into in order to reset the board, uh, the game state was critical there. And look at the board state now, just like what you saw last match, five characters on board, pretty much a full grip against my opponent. And what is this card really going to do against this? Nothing. I have 10 lore, they have zero. I have, well, I did have um, five characters on board, but I have double evasives. I have, yeah, I'm questing for eight on board. Like there's almost nothing you can do here. Uh, I'm just going to take out their hook just because uh, they basically need, yeah, there's nothing they can do, right? Steel Emerald. Yeah, there's nothing they can do. Double grab your swords because they don't, they don't even have enough ink for that. I've dropped another Beast Tragic Hero. I'm going to quest for game here. It's, yeah, it's over. So, um, yeah, I just give them the well played. And there again, you can see how we can counter some of the interesting strategies in the metagame with this deck. So, yeah, if you haven't uh, tried this out yet, I would recommend it. It's a very fun deck to play. But this is going to wrap up this match. Let's go on to the next one. All right, in these next couple of matches, again, inking, or sorry, uh, mulliganing our uninkables and hoping to draw into lower cost curve. Once again, we ink the Benja there and play out the hook. In this deck, contrary to what I've said in the past where I was like, you don't want to play your hook on turn one, in this deck you absolutely can because you have whole new world. So despite not having as many resources in hand to ink, you're likely going to be able to hold new world and reset everything anyways. So just dumping as much as onto the field as possible, as with most steel decks that play a whole new world, is totally fine. Now this opponent reveals that they're on red purple, pretty much the best deck in the format. And um, I skipped ahead a little bit because you know the, the start of the game is just bouncing and it's kind of irrelevant. Um, but here you can see that we leverage the whole new world into advantage. Whole new world beats red purple. Um, it beat it in set one, it still beats it in set two because think about it, right? As they bounce their cards back to hand, they lose tempo air quotes, but they, they have advantage. Um, but then if you discard their whole hand, there goes the cards that they bounce back and look at the board presence difference here, right? Um, we draw into the Benja, we drop it on that spell book. We have total control of the match. They're not even close to be prepared yet. Well, I guess they're coming up to it, but we're going to be on very, very high um, lore count by the time they drop the be prepared. And so we're just going to continue to quest with everything. They could drop a Maui here, but that's not really that threatening because they're going to either take out a, okay, or a Tremaine and I'll just take out a hook from it. So yeah, the opponent really doesn't have too many options. Um, my guess is they did this because they know that they have a whole new world. Um, so I just put some damage on the Tremaine and I, you know, in hindsight, I probably should not have done this because that just wastes race resources for the ring the bell. Because like I said, if they're going to hold new world anyways, they would just quest for two and then, and then, um, sorry, uh, be prepared and then be prepared. And sure enough, they do be prepared. And that's why I didn't end up playing out my last four ink to drop my Tinkerbell um, because I was expecting that be prepared. So here I'm going to drop a beast tragic hero and ink the Tinkerbell so that I can drop a Cheshire Cat in case they have a second Tremaine. Because my thought is if they drop Tremaine last turn they probably have a second one in hand um, where they could utilize it to much better effect and taking out my beast tragic hero the opponent can't do anything and they just end up scooping it up there so in this final clip here i've skipped ahead a little bit to where the match becomes a little bit more relevant we are going up against the amethyst emerald aggro deck and this color combination was pretty popular in the beginning where people thought it was going to be really good but um i think i think it is good i think it top aided that ppg tournament um and it got maybe top four or something don't quote me on that though so you know it's not necessarily a completely dead deck by any means but i just think that whenever you run these hyper aggro strategies you are really at risk of just dying to anything steel and that's exactly what you see here um, we take out the Flynn Rider with the Smash. We leave the Pinocchio because we're not threatened by it at all because Robin Hood completely counters every single um, high questing, um, low willpower character. So Lilo's, Maleficent's, Pinocchio's, etc. Um, we have the whole new world that we're not even worried about using. We finally draw into the Tragic Hero and we can always discard the whole new world with the Tinkerbell, but we just pass because the Mim Snake is a big body. They play a goat and we know they have Pinocchio in hand. We double draw into Relentless Beast and the Cheshire Cat. So we're going to ink Cheshire and play Relentless Beast. Just continue to quest with the um, Tinkerbell and pass. The opponent knows they cannot play that Pinocchio because Robin Hood would finish it off. Basically, their only bet is like, I use the Robin Hood, then they try to take out the Robin Hood. So they sacrifice their Pinocchio. They're going to bippity boppity boo once again in order to recycle the Mim Snake. And this is an interesting concept. I actually like this combo, but um, 
yeah, it doesn't really work out too well against Steel. Uh, we forget to quest with Relentless Beast before playing the Tinkerbell, but that's okay. Um, so we lose out on two lore there, but we're going to quest with Beast. And at this point, I'm like, I can get that goat out of their hand and just have one less goat to deal with. Yes, I will give them a fresh seven, but I think at this point I have way too much advantage that I can easily just whole new world here. And again, it's five to one and we can even take out the Mim Snake so that our Robin Hood is continued to be protected here. And it's just game and the opponent ends up scooping it up once they realize that there's nothing they can do. And that is how powerful this deck can be.